Hi, I'm Brian Miller. I know that the world can work for everyone, but that it won't until it works for you. I've created this to help you make the difference you were born to make. It's a series of conversations with thought leaders who are moving humanity forward. And in each episode, I explore their lives and the work they do. I also ask them to break down how they've gotten their books written, published, and read. This podcast is all about exploring the magic and mystery, and sometimes the misery, of the creative process. So if you have a mission, a message, and a motivation to share it, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the School for Good Living. Hello, my friends. Today, my guest is Adam Piore. Adam is author of The Bodybuilders, Inside the Science of the Engineered Human. This is a fascinating book that explores the cutting edge of science and technology as it relates to the human body, explores things like advanced prosthetics, the regeneration of lost limbs and lost digits, technologies that help the blind to see, quadriplegics who are able to drink milk by thinking, just many, many things that I hadn't even thought about until I read about them in this book. Adam is an award-winning journalist based in New York. He's been freelance writing since 2010. He's a former editor and correspondent for Newsweek magazine. He also has written narrative features in Condé Nast Traveler, GQ, Discover Magazine, Mother Jones, Playboy. You get the idea. So he's got incredible experience as a writer. He's been around the world. In fact, we talk about some of his formative experiences seeking adventure and experience in Cambodia. And if there's one thing that you take away from this interview, perhaps it's this idea that we all have things we can be better at. We all have areas to learn. It's easy to look at somebody who's where we want to be, who's doing what we want to do and think, man, they are there. They are amazing. And they probably are. But at the same time, things, seemingly little things that maybe are easy for us are not necessarily easy for them. Overall, it's a fascinating interview. It's one that might open your mind to the possibilities of the human body and even the human spirit. Get yourself ready. Enjoy. Adam, welcome to the School for Good Living. Uh, thanks for having me. Good to be here. Adam, will you tell me, please, what's life about? Uh, hmm, okay, yeah, that's an interesting question. So what, what do you mean exactly? Do you mean what's the meaning of life or what makes you happy? Or When you think of that question, because as you're acknowledging, there's a lot of different ways to come at that question. What's the purpose of life? What's the purpose of my life? You know, is there some kind of biological imperative, something? I mean, whatever, when you hear that question... What's life about? Whether we're talking about life itself or your life, however you're inclined to answer it, um, I'm curious to know what kind of initial response you have to. And by the way, this is my favorite question for Uber drivers. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, what's life about? Well, well, I guess, I mean, hmm, what would I say? Um, I mean, if there is a, uh, a God, right, I don't really, uh, it, it seems like it would be incomprehensible, right? It's beyond words or you know so if there's nature or whatever it's it's i can't really put it into words i just know what feels right in terms of the way i live my life um intuitively and you know what makes me happy you know i'm I'm 48 now so i have some life experience and uh you know i think when i was younger i i actually really wanted to know what the meaning of life was and what would make lead to a more satisfying life and i spent a lot of time trying to find it and um one of the reasons I became a journalist is because um, I wanted to have adventures and uh, I knew I wanted to not be held back by fear. Um, and that's one of the things I've done. And, but as I've looked at this question, I guess I, I've, I've picked up some wisdom. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is uh, there's this study that Harvard did called the Harvard grant study. And it's the longest uh, longitudinal study of men uh, in history. I think they around, um, the time when when John F. Kennedy and Ben Bradley were were uh, undergraduates at Harvard, they started tracking a group of people that included John F. Kennedy and and Ben Bradley, and they tracked these these men through their whole lives. Uh, and initially, I think they were you know looking at um, the uh, um, like body types and stuff, or I don't know. But as research advanced, they began to look at what led to life satisfaction, particularly towards the end of these people, these men's lives. And they found that, you know, it wasn't material things. It had to do with the quality of their relationships and the meaning of their work. Um, so those two things, I mean, are kind of what I arrived at intuitively. I, I found for myself um, also a big moment for me was when I was um, I was in Kuwait for Newsweek waiting to go into Iraq with, you know, embedded with the troops. 
um, back in 2003. And, you know, there was all sorts of talk about chemical weapons and stuff. And I wasn't even really, um, you know, when I go in dangerous situations as a journalist, when I was younger, what I found was the worst moments were the night before when I'm lying alone and I can be neurotic about it and think about things. But in this case, I was with a bunch of young soldiers and troops, sort of part of a, a tribe, a pack. I felt protected, but I was aware on some level that I might die. And what happened was um, all these thoughts started coming up. Um, all these memories and the memories were of people I loved. Um, I had a girlfriend at the time who I wasn't in love with and all these memories of the girl that I had been in love with came up and all these memories of my parents and friends. And um, I just um, realized that that was what was meaningful. You know, I was so grateful that I experienced love in my life and, uh, and I wasn't scared. It was just, that was what I was most grateful for having had as I thought about that. And then, of course, you know, it was totally safe when I went to Iraq, pretty much. and I didn't die. But uh, <laughs> so that taught me a lot. And when I came back, you know, you know, now I have a wife and kids and and uh, that's important to me. So I think uh, the life is, is sort of about, about love and meaning uh, once you get past um, your basic needs. You know, they found if you, you know, if you can't meet your basic needs, um, you're pretty unhappy. But um once you get to a certain level, it doesn't matter sort of how much you have. And we have a happiness set point that we often return to, you know, people who win the lottery or people who are paralyzed six or eight months later after an adjustment period, they're back to where they were before pretty much in terms of life satisfaction. So that's remarkable. And I, and what I love about your answer is that it's not, it's not like someone without life experience, just spouting theory, but as you've said, you know, you've been in Kuwait, you've been in, been around the world. Um, you know, I want to talk to you about your time in Cambodia, your time in Colombia. In fact, I'm curious just now, have you counted the number of countries you visited at this point? I think at one point I did, but I forgot. Like somebody said that they had been to a bunch of countries and they were really proud of it. And I was like, hmm, I wonder if I've been to that many countries. And then I, I kind of counted. Um, but I don't really know. I've been to a lot of countries. Yeah. And not I just I haven't really been to Africa except for Morocco. Yeah. And not just like the, the tourist sightseeing countries, right? I mean, you've gone and you've seen some of the biggest challenges that humanity faces, it seems to me. And I heard you use the word adventure in your previous answer. But will you tell me a little bit about what motivated you to go to Cambodia and what you some of what you learned in your time there? Sure. Well, yeah. Okay. Well, so uh, actually I had two, two grandfathers. One was, uh, um, I mean, obviously I had two grandfathers, but my father's father was uh, sort of the, he w had the typical American dream story, came over through Ellis Island when he was a kid, lived in Harlem, was poor, rose to become a physicist, um, vice president of research for IBM and advisor to presidents and was kind of loaded, you know, and, and, and a uh, complicated man, but very, very, um, sort of established. And the other one was my mom's um, grandfather, and he um, was not nearly as dignified. Uh, he was a, a short, fat, bald um, rewrite man for the New York Daily News who smoked a cigar and drank whiskey. Um, well, it seems to me now, as I'm older, maybe it's because he was drinking the whiskey, but he seemed like the happiest man I knew. And he always talked to me about how he couldn't imagine a more satisfying life than the one he'd had as a journalist, that the people were great. Um, et cetera. And he also would tell me these stories about when he went over to Europe during World War II, well, actually in 1939, and, you know, was in Prague with the Duke and a Duchess on a balcony drinking the best champagne out of crystal glasses and then throwing them off a balcony to shatter them so the Nazis wouldn't get them and smuggled out some count's manuscript past, you know, Nazi lines or something. And it was, you know, so romantic. I wanted to have those kind of adventures. And, and um, I became a journalist and it was very competitive. I mean, it's really competitive now. It was pretty competitive before. And, uh, and I didn't go to Harvard or, or something. I went to UC Santa Cruz, which is a fine school, but um, I, you know, it's really hard to be, to make it in journalism. So I was eager to get going and, and I had gotten into, um, Eventually, I got into Columbia Journalism School, and then I went straight into, I got a job out of there, and I went straight into the career track. And at like in, in my 20s, I got the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. and cover Congress. And uh, But I was covering, I was working for a paper in New Jersey called the Bergen Record, and I was covering everything with a New Jersey angle. And uh, 
and it was exciting at first and really interesting. And I learned a, a lot about history, but I really, I began to feel pretty deadened by being in DC after a couple of years, especially during the Monica Lewinsky, um, uh, hearings and stuff, because my once it was kind of like now with Trump, but, um, when th this happened, the media, there was no, it sucked all the air out of the room. And the only thing people wanted to read about was the Monica Lewinsky scandal. So I had to stand off the house floor and, and, and do the New Jersey angle. I had to ask New Jersey congressmen and women every day what their opinion was of the latest revelation. It was just kind of soul deadening, you know? I mean, who cares? They're all saying the same thing. You know, they all, whether they're Democrat or Republican, they had their talking points. And I just, and also everyone was so work obsessed and I just wanted to have adventures. So I quit my job and I went to go travel uh, in Southeast Asia. And um, I think, um, I mean, it's kind of a long story, but um, I went back to, um, my, my plan was, um, okay, now I have like a good resume and uh, I'm going to go travel and just like lie on the beach somewhere. And then when I get tired of it, I'm going to like freelance a couple stories and then make it look like I was working the whole time. And then I, it won't hurt my career and I can get a job. And, and this is, this is mid, mid nineties. You say? Yeah. Oh, it's like 1998, 99. Okay. So I go back to Columbia Journalism School to, and I go through their alumni thing to, um, to, uh, to look for possible freelance gigs. And uh, I run into this former professor of mine from when I was there. And she's like, what are you up to? And people have been telling me for months that I was throwing my career away and it was the biggest mistake I would ever make. And how could I leave in the middle of this history, Monica Lewinsky? And so I was kind of tired of that. So I said, well, I'm going to travel, but my plan is to get a job in an English language newspaper, and which wasn't true really at all. And she said, well, oh, which one? And I said, the only one I had heard of was this paper called the Cambodia Daily because somebody had come in to talk to my journalism school class. And I was like, oh, the Cambodia Daily. And she's like, really? My protege from the New York Herald Tribune owns the paper and started it. You should contact <laughs> So I was like, all right. And then I wasn't even going to contact him, but then... The day before I left, because I because you know my ambition and fear of failure had had prevented me from doing what I wanted to do, which was explore the world. So I was like, I'm not going to do it. But then I got scared the day before I left for Southeast Asia. I just had a ticket to Singapore, and I was just going to backpack around. And I sent the guy an email, and uh, and then I arrived in Singapore, and and and, and it was pretty cool. And I was going to go to Indonesia, and there was an email waiting for me for him, and he was like, Wow, well you know, you should come here. You can pay your own way. I'll give you, you can do a tryout, blah, blah, blah. It didn't sound very good. And I didn't really want to do it. So I think I just kind of ignored the email. And I went down in Indonesia and I was trekking around. I had a great time. I, I went on a 10 day trek into this, on this island with it, that had broken off the coast of Sumatra 500,000 years ago. And there were like, you know, uh, it was kind of hardcore. You could, there were these um, people living in the jungle and and, uh, you know, making loincloths out of tree bark and stuff. And so I had these, this 10 day adventure with other people. These are the same, same, sorry, sorry to, to jump in, but I, these are the same kind of people. Some people try to convert. Is that, is that this part of the world? Uh, well, that the one where the guy got killed recently was in, yeah. um, that was in the Indian ocean off of India in South okay. Asia. Okay. This is further South. This is Indonesia, but yeah, I mean, people tried to convert them, I guess. And, um, but anyways, uh, yeah, but these people are worship animus spirits and stuff. And um, if they get converted, they still worship animus spirits. But anyways, I came out of the jungle and this guy was like, OK, people just quit. I need somebody here. I'll pay your airfare. I'll, I'll pay your salary for a month. I'll put you up. We'll let you know in a month if you're hired. And if you don't like it, you can stay on those terms for three months. So I was like, I mean, sorry, it's a very long story here. But I was like, OK, that sounds good. I'm kind of tired of being a tourist because it's not as immersive as when you're a journalist, when you can just go talk to people and you're thrust into the center of things. And it seemed like a great tool. Now I no longer felt trapped and it just seemed like a great tool and I wouldn't be as isolated. It was kind of isolating traveling alone. I only did it for like a three weeks or a month, but I was like, all right, that sounds like a good deal. And Cambodia sounded like Mars, you know? Um, and I, um, so I went and um, yeah, it was just a magical place. I mean, what, what blew my mind about Cambodia was that, um, you know, there, it was emerging from 30 years of, of civil war, a genocide where one in four people died of starvation, murder or disease. And uh, then, then, you know, it was pawn the Cold War occupied by Vietnam. Yeah. Till, um, and uh, that's hard to imagine. Yeah. And, and so there was a huge U.N. presence and then and they were rebuilding everything from scratch. And then there had been a coup d'etat. And, and so there was a lot of hope and 
and it, it, it was sort of uncorrupted by modern culture. So it was just fascinating. And then people were dealing with just the, the fundamentals there. You know, they've been through this unimaginable trauma. They were trying to rebuild life and nobody had been held to account or arrested. So there was all these, you could go interview the mass murderers and ask them if they were sorry. And that was always something I did. Sometimes they were, sometimes they weren't. Will you, will you tell me about that? I mean, that sounds, first of all, that sounds dangerous. And second of all, that sounds really, really interesting. <laughs> like what, I mean, how did you, I mean, I guess you would know who they were, but why did, like, how did you approach them and what did they say? Well, it's kind of weird because it's like, um, for one thing, there was like, it's not like now um, when kind of Cambodia is under the influence of China. Now we sort of, we're not doing anything over there really. Uh, and we kind of pulled back, but um, back then it was reliant to a huge extent on foreign aid from the UN and Western countries. And, um, you know, everybody knew that if you, if you killed a Westerner, it would bring hell down on your head. So nobody really uh, would do that impulsively. You know, and right. these were and the, the, these were former Khmer Rouge people and and the civil war had raged on and on. And, and they it sort of just ended and they had their territories. Right. Uh, so they had they had um, surrendered to the government and been absorbed into the military. But they were still these like semi autonomous regions. So you would go there and they all knew each other. It was kind of small. And the Cambodia Daily, the idea was that um, it was uh, run by this former Newsweek guy and it was training and capacity building. Uh, training Cambodian journalists to be uh, by Western journalists. So I was always paired up with a Cambodian journalist, usually my own age, who was just learning or, or maybe not learning. Sometimes they were better than me. And we would go out and, and, uh, and we would um, interview people together, you know, and they would translate the answers. And, uh, and so, um, I mean, well, and, and there was all this talk at the time of a UN tribunal to try the surviving leaders of the Khmer Rouge. So you could, get sort of a front page story anytime if you found one of these leaders and asked them what they thought about the tribunal and if they would go, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and let's see. Um, uh, sorry, email from an editor at Newsweek. Uh, that's distracting. But, um, and so uh, we went to this one area and um, I don't know. We asked, there was this guy named K. Pock. He was like a number two in the region and had been, you know, there's all these scholars who had studied what happened between 1975 and 1979. He was credited with, you know, overseeing this brutal, you know, a lot of the, these were like Stalinist purges where they killed members of their own. And so he was involved in something that in with tens of thousands of deaths. And, um, that guy just sounds like he'd have a, a big scar and an, and like an eye patch. K. Pock. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, actually, his boss had an eye patch and a glass eye. The guy named Tom Mock. He oh was missing gosh. a leg. Wow. They called him the butcher, and he was like one eye. But there was a lot of people straight out of Central Casting. Wow. Um, but this guy, um, what did we do? We went. We found out where he lived because I was with the Cambodian reporter who was really good, and just by asking around, because there was a lot of former Khmer Rouge in the area, and this guy was like a prominent individual. It's like going to Hollywood and asking where Tom Cruise's house is. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you could drive by it. So they kind of, we kind of found out where it was, and then we bought a, bought a bottle of Johnny Walker Red, um, and we went to his house and knocked on the door, and then I sort of let the, the Cambodian journalist just said, you know, we have some questions about history. You know, because they, they, they did what they did, but they, and some of them were murderous and psychotic, but they did it out of ideology, and they did it because they were true believers. You know what I mean? Yeah. So they were willing to talk about history, I guess and their nation's history. It's extremely, the Khmer Rouge were extremely nationalist movement. So there was ways of um, talking to them and asking questions to get into things. And I guess in this, sort of the Asian way, you're supposed to come at things um, indirectly. So, so there was that. And, and he was, you know, just kind of evasive. He didn't get hostile. There are other times when people got hostile, you know, like there's another guy um, who was actually Tom Ock's stepson. And I, 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 this was a few years later, I was back in Cambodia and, um, his name was me as Mutt and he was an extremely, um, murderous evil dude. And when I talked to him, um, at Tom Ock's funeral, I went to cover, um, he said, what did he say? I was asking him questions. He was being evasive. And he said, the past is like a stick. Do not stir the placid waters of 
the present, which are peaceful, with the stick, or it will muddy the waters. And I don't know, he would make <laughs> strange metaphors that, <laughs> that were like threats, you know? Yeah, it sounds like a line out, out, of, out of James Bond. Yeah. Right. So, um, so that, but that was intense. And, and then, I, you know, of course, I was, I, everyone I knew, even the, the reporters had lost family members in the genocide. So oh. this is unimaginable trauma. And you went back. Yeah, I lived there for for a year and a half. I mean, I made made great friends, and it was such a um, I don't know the culture there so welcoming and friendly and smiley. I guess. I mean, even if they some people could beat people, others to death with sticks, they yeah. <laughs> were still friendly. I don't know, you know and uh, and open I, and I, and 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 so strangely not cynical. No. I mean, cynical, but not in a I don't know, not not in the way you would think. Well, let, let me ask you this: As I hear you articulate, you know your experience there, and you know I don't, I don't remember who it was that said the past is a foreign country, like they do things different there, differently, you know there. But clearly, you know this: you're talking about a time when you went to Cambodia, where it, the internet was really just coming into to broad use, and email was existing, and things like this. It was a different world then; it was a different time, it was a different country. But one thing that I think a lot about is whether things like that, you know, or things like the rise of the Nazis, you know, how much of that could ever happen in the United States or just how much is inherent, you know, how we all have dark and light inside us or good and evil, if you want to say it that way. And and I wonder how much you think about that just with your friends, family, neighbors, others that you interact with, like how much of that is in there, just kind of waiting for the right conditions or circumstances to find expression because I wonder, you know, in an area where there is the rule of law and we do have food in the grocery stores and, you know, there's property rights and like all these kinds of structures that keep us in the guardrails, so to speak, what you were able to see about human nature in that environment in Cambodia in that time that maybe you still see here, but it's a little bit more muted. I mean, do you – I don't know if that question is making sense, but I'm wondering – how much of what you saw there you kind of see here, but not in its full expression? Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Um, you know, um, Cambodia, it was a very um, kind of, I, it, I mean, I'm almost ashamed to say it, but, um, and I was around gunfire a little bit and stuff at one point, but um, it didn't really seem that real to me. It still seemed like a very foreign place, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and so it wasn't as traumatic. I mean, I thought a lot about it. There was a book that um, I bought that I was really into when I was in Cambodia. And, mm -hmm. and a lot of people were into when I showed it to him. It was called On Killing. And it was written by um, a psychiatrist or psychologist who taught at West Point who studied the phenomenon of killing and what it does to people, you know, um, how you get people to do it. Um, and... Um, you know, historically how that's been handled in militaries. And, uh, and, you know, cause they found, I think, you know, now they go through all these drills. They make you like, you, before they made you stab dummies with bayonets and shoot so that it was automatic. They found that like in the civil war or something, I forget, I think it was that, you know, like a lot of the guns were never fired, you uh -huh. know, cause uh -huh. it's against their nature to do it. So you need to, to get the muscle memory in there. So people do it automatically. Now, now we kind of do that with video games, I guess. But, um, all sorts of things about that and, and, you know, how it can mess you up and stuff. Yeah. Um, so I was interested in that and studying all of that. And I knew theoretically it all applied to the United States. And I thought about the war in Vietnam and I met people who were messed up by that. And, and I knew that all these dark impulses were possible, but um, it wasn't until I, I actually covered nine 11 for grounds from, from ground zero for Newsweek. I, I went down there on nine 11 and I saw a, a, like a leg sticking up out of the ground. And I saw all these, uh, dead bodies of people who looked like people I'd see on the subway, you know, New Yorkers. Yeah. And that really kind of messed me up a lot more than Cambodia. I guess I hadn't really seen dead bodies. I'm not sure, but, but it just really drove home to me the same phenomena that happened in Cambodia could happen, just how cheap life was and how easily it could be taken. And that really messed me up a little bit at first. And, and things were never the same. I, I never kind of covered things with the same reckless abandon and, and uh, just, I, I realized, I used to think that if you stared into the dark side, you would get some wisdom that would make you, you know, a better, wiser and a better person, but uh, that you would gain some sort of insight, which maybe I did, but I, I felt in the moment I saw those things, I felt kind of this sick feeling like I lost something, 
you know, and, and I realized there was a cost to seeing traumatic stuff, you know, mm-hmm. so I wasn't as eager to seek it out. Yeah, but that's, that's, uh, anyways, my, my point is, um, so it, it really became more real to me then. That's when I sort of made the connection. But, um, but I also was interested just from a political point of view, since I covered Congress and governments and stuff um, and wrote about things. Um, I worked for for, Fareed Zakaria at Newsweek International, and so wrote about different countries. I wanted to know, like, what causes a civil war and how can you tell when it's going to happen? And so there is a book uh, I read called The Anatomy of a Revolution. That's an old book that looked at, like, the French Revolution and stuff. And it looked at some of the the things that are necessary, like, um, you know, the middle, the elites joining you know, even if it's if usually if the wars are started by a small group of disenfranchised, it's the, the elites have to sign on before there's a revolution. And I studied all that, but I was still wondering, like, well, how do you know that war is about to break out? Like, how do you know that there's going to be a civil war and people are going to start to kill each other? So how can I know uh, that this is going to happen, you know, in the, if it was ever going to happen in the U.S.? And I read there's this great book by V.S. Naipaul that I read called The Bend in the River, which is it tells the story of the shopkeeper in Africa um, as the war is approaching, that he's in denial. He doesn't think it can happen there because that's human nature. And then, then it arrives, and it's a really great look at that. But um, it wasn't until I went to Iraq, where I, I always thought there would be signs that would be subtle, and you could you could tell, you know. Mm-hmm. And and so I, I was reading all the history about this. Then I went to Iraq, and I was with the U.S. troops in northern Iraq. And I saw them uh, like handing out money from the U.S. government or, and food and stuff. And these crowds would gather and they were so pissed off and so angry. Not to, and, and I just I knew that they were that was what civil war looked like. Like the date like this was before the Sunnis and Shiites started slaughtering each other. Mm-hmm. But it was clear that they would do that. You know what I mean? Because I I knew about the ethnic tensions between the Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds in Iraq. And and the populace was so angry. You could just feel the tension and the rage boiling up uh, at a breaking point. And so then I was like, oh, well, it's pretty obvious when there's going to be civil war. You know, you could feel it in the air. People seem violent, you know. And I never saw anything like that in the U.S. until, you know, recently, I I feel like... um, tensions are rising and yeah, totally. We could have civil war here. Sometimes I wonder um, how far away, I mean, I don't know if I don't really think that's going to happen in our lifetime. I hope not. Uh, But, um, but I feel like we're a lot closer now just in the fact that the level of rage and um, tribalism, people, people keep talking about tribalism. I mean, I I think about it now as like what I realized from Facebook, because I have friends on both sides is it's really there it's not really a, and most people have probably come to this conclusion by now but it's not really a logical discourse that's going on when when people um argue on facebook and and the thing that and and, and i've done stories about the psychology of it and what it is is it's, it's the same phenomenon as as like um your favorite um football or basketball or baseball team well i guess you said your family owns the utah jazz so it's like yep. utah jazz fans are never going to be um, well, who's the rival of the Utah Jazz? I don't know. We're still we're still having a hard time getting over Michael Jordan and the Bulls from 20 years ago. <laughs> right. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, I grew up in Boston. It's Red Sox, Yankees. So yeah. it's yeah. like that's the same thing with Democrats and Republicans now and Trump and and uh, and Obama, I guess. You know, it's yeah. like it's and, and, and I also I did a story recently for Scientific American where um, they wanted me to um, write about um, teaching kids who are grow up with a strict literalist interpretation of the Bible, like fundamentalist Christians teaching them evolution. And I went down to Georgia and what I really gleaned from that, there's a new effort underway by the Smithsonian and, and, you know, people sort of the Northeastern elites and the intellectuals and science have not fully appreciated, you know, it's some of the, I talked to a bunch of people who had grown up as uh, hardcore Christians told about, you know, taught creationism, who later became scientists that came to accept evolution. And for them, the way they described the, the process was as wrenching as being gay and coming out of the closet. I mean, it was wow. like, it was an identity issue. These issues go to identity. Yeah. And so when I was in these classrooms, it's like, you're never going to teach some kid who's uh, 15 
and whose entire family and everyone they know is telling them that God created the earth in seven days and evolution is impossible, that they're wrong and they're idiot. You know, it's, it's a very wrenching thing to ask somebody to believe this stuff. You just need, you need to find ways to teach them the theory of evolution in a way that is, is separate from their belief and their identity and stuff. So, so, and one of the things that Trump does and also Democrats do with identity politics is they tap into, you know, our, our identities, you know, like, yeah. so if you're, if you identify yourself as a repressed member of a repressed minority or, or somebody who's gay and could, could be attacked and your existence is threatened, of course, you're going to vote for Democrats if, if they appeal to those issues and say, uh, Republicans are homophobic and they're blah, blah, blah. And if you're, um, I guess a white male who feels that an immigrant that, uh, and you're struggling to, to find a job in this changing economy and, and you feel like immigrants are coming in and, and ruining the country. Um, and ruining your way of life and people appeal to that and press that button, it, it works to get you to vote for them too. So these things go not to intellectual ideas that can really can be debated on Facebook. They go to issues of identity. Yeah. And that's, um, that is how civil wars start. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. Shiite Sunni in, in, uh, in Cambodia, it was a class identity. It was nationalism. Um, but, um, now we're getting into these identity issues and people are not really talking to each other. And, and people have been warning for years about the breakdown of, you know, civil society. Like, I, I don't know, everything's always exaggerated. Right. But there's yeah. some book, which I haven't read, but that I hear about called bowling alone, you know, and it's like, oh, yeah. we used to meet at PTAs and everything. And now we don't. So. One thing I wonder is with all you've seen, you know, the people you've talked to, what you've witnessed in this lifetime, your own thinking, and experience. How can we do that? How can we have the conversation about something like the theory of evolution? And it can be anything, of course, right? Because it's the same mechanics at work. But how can we have a conversation with someone about something that doesn't threaten their identity or their belief system, but still opens, you know, it cre it leads to opens or leads to a dialogue, opens a possibility, creates a shared understanding instead of more of the shouting or more of the position taking and the wrong making that is going on now? How can we how can we do that? Yeah, we we just have to focus on what we have in common. I mean, like uh, I, I saw a study somewhere that one of some of the most productive political discussions go on, you know, between Democrats and Republicans go on, on um, like uh, the, the comment sections of sports threads, mm -hmm. you know, because there are people are, 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 are connected by another identity. So you need that civil society and stuff and you need to understand the dynamics in play, that it's sort of an identity issue, that it's a class issue. Uh, wow. sometimes that it's a whatever. But I also feel like um, there's a certain level of recklessness here that, for instance, I mean, people, there's this tendency amongst um, some in our country to sort of make fun of the uptight Europeans and call them socialists and stuff, but they are uptight for a reason. You know, they went through wars where, where there where certain types of rhetoric decimated, led, you know, it, we haven't had a war on our soil that's killed tens of millions of people. So it's a lot easier to be reckless with, with these types of things, you know what I mean? And let them get under, out of control. And like in Europe, they're paranoid because they don't, that kind of rhetoric um, where it's appealing to identity and stuff, they know that it can lead to the, these kinds of passions. So I don't know, sometimes I worry that it's going to take, and, and also we don't really realize how good we have it, you know, like, so I, I've been, I've been in Cambodia and Iraq and I understand what an incredible quality of life we have, but people don't really appreciate that. And it's human nature almost to be dissatisfied with what you have. Sure. And, and so sometimes I feel like, like it's just going to have to get to a crisis point. And yeah. I, I don't know how much we're going to have to lose, uh, you know, whether there will be some terrible devastating war or something on our soil. Um, I hope not, but, um, but you know, what can you do? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I well, try and, I mean, yeah, I think I think in some ways it goes back to what you said in the opening question about love and, you know, relationships and meaning in work, you know, this kind of thing, finding meaning, finding ways to contribute to others and achieve self-expression, you know, in an authentic way that's based on kind of common interests or shared understanding. Um, maybe that <laughs> little meditation thrown in never hurt. We've been talking for a little while now, and I, I haven't yet asked you about your book. I haven't asked you about the bodybuilders inside the science of the engineered human. Who did you write this book for and what did you want it to do for them? Hmm, well, let's see. There's what I said in the book, which isn't necessarily what I was thinking at the time. So I have to try and, you know, I have multiple narratives of how I think about this. I mean, uh, 
like some of the things that I, I stumbled upon, I only learned about later on, like why I was following them. So for instance, um, you know, the emphasis on, um, on resilience, um, you know, that was something that I thought a lot about in Cambodia and, and Iraq and stuff, obviously. And I, I hadn't realized that, um, I was that interested in resilience in the human body and mind. Uh, but, but when I learned that, um, that, uh, that scientists were making new discoveries and unleashing these mechanisms in the human body and mind that could heal broken bodies and minds. Um, I just found it fascinating. And, and that was sort of what led me down this path. So what, but what happened is, um, I just, you know, like I said, I used to work at Newsweek. So when I went freelance, I think I was a features editor at Reader's Digest and I, um, I got laid off and I, I wanted to freelance and, and a lot of magazines were going under. I think Newsweek was sold for a dollar. Reader's Digest was bankrupt, but science magazines were still doing well. And I had these contacts, friends who were editors at science magazines, uh, because the, the, the things that are happening in science are so revolutionary that I guess people feel compelled to read magazines like, Sci like Scientific American, Discover, and Popular Science. So um, I majored in psychology in college, and uh, I started looking at neuroscience, and, um, and, I, and I was kind of interested in, in that. And then I also, I, I came across a story, uh, just an incredible human story of this guy, Hugh Herr, who had, um, he had lost both of his legs um, to frostbite um, during, in, in a sort of a, he had wandered into the woods. He was a, a, a very successful teen rock climbing prodigy. And he wandered into the, the woods of Mount Washington and got lost with his friend. And they, they almost died. And he had both his legs were amputated. And he had been a C and a D student in school. Um, but um, he started um, tinkering with his prosthetics so that he could climb again. And he made them like uh, 12 feet long and, you know, made ones with little blades that allowed him to climb and crevices and stuff. And, and he was back on the wall rock climbing, um, you know, doing what he loved to do, what people told him he'd never be able to do again. I'll bet that freaked a lot of people out that saw him, you know, somebody with kind of metal legs two or three times longer than normal. But between the weight that he didn't need to pull up and the specialized equipment that he put on his lower extremities, that's that's a pretty amazing um, kind of modification by necessity. Right. I mean, he was an amputee. But when you talk about that in the book, I was I was really fascinated. And that's right for anybody who hasn't picked this book up yet in the first right from the first chapter. You just get exposed to some amazing concepts, things that hopefully, you, you know, from a personal experience, you'll never be exposed to losing limbs due to frostbite. But Hugh's story of resilience was really inspiring. Yeah. So, I mean, um, it was amazing. So he because he because he did this with his you know, so successfully with his climbing stuff, he began to study science and pay attention in school for the first time, became a straight A student, wondered why his prosthetics when he walked were so terrible when he felt free on the on the wall and, and didn't want to accept that um, he could uh, would never walk again and start studying that and became one of the leading prosthetics engineers and now is at MIT. And, and, um, and I just you know, I did this story because it was an incredible human story and I love telling stories, you know, um, and it was, he had just as much resiliency as some of those people I met in Cambodia. It's an incredible strength of will, but also the science was fascinating. And, and, and what I discovered is that, um, you know, we've developed the computational power and the electronics ability to the sensing ability with electronics to be able to measure components of the human body and mind and find patterns in them and analyze them at a level of a resolution that would have been impossible before. So we're able to do things that we couldn't do before. And with Hugh Herr, um, you know, he built these bionic limbs that replicate the real thing. And what they do is, um, you know, you might have seen the, the, uh, the pictures of you know, the commercials for EA Sports where you have like LeBron with those motion capture things with those those metal balls up and down his leg and arm and yep. and they, they use motion caption cameras and then they recreate that using his video game avatar. So he Hugh Herr did that with with people walking with normal legs and, and he built a computational model of how all the constituent parts of the lower leg and foot interact. Like, you know, if you if you step down with this angle and your tendon is this stretched, what does it do to the tendon over here? And what he discovered, what well, was partially known, 
but he measured it um, so he could put in a computational model. And what's been found in recent years is that, you know, when one of the reasons prosthetics are so bad for your back is they're just dead weights, but that's not how the human leg works. The human leg is actually a bunch of giant springs. And every time we step, uh, our legs absorb energy and shuffle them in this dynamic web of tendons, uh, ligaments and muscles and, and, and then, and release them so that we spring up and, and we don't, and we can recycle energy. So he figured out how this dynamic web works. He modeled it on a computer and then he built a bionic limb that could actually emulate what their real human leg was doing. And this wouldn't have been possible just a few years ago. And so, and he had done this. And so it's amazing that we've reached that, you know, that he stepped over that threshold of, of technological innovation. And it's only been, you know, in this millennium that he's done that. And, and then with my book, I just looked at, you know, they're trying to do that on a much broader level in many different areas of the body and mind. So the most extreme example uh, of attempting to do that is with the human brain. Like, so I, I found people who were suffering, suffering from Lou Gehrig's disease, you know, who get locked in and they still have a functional brain that can produce language. So they're trying to uh, use technologies to decode imagined speech to, to sense what different neurons are doing and then use uh, computational programs to, to figure out what patterns represent what and try and translate those thoughts back into speech, just as our body might be able to. And we don't yet have the algorithms that are powerful enough because there's just too many variables. You know, we have uh, mil billions of, of brain cells, right? And, and so there's a lot going on there. There's a lot firing, but it, it, there is a neural signature for different words and, and different things, you know? So, um, and what you write about, I mean, everything from not only these innovations that Hugh discovered with prosthetics, but, you know, helping technologies that help the blind see quadriplegics that can drink milk by thinking, you know, moving p people who are regenerating, regrowing lost limbs or digits. I mean, of everything that you, that you researched and you write about in here, what was most surprising for you personally? I mean, I don't know. Pretty much everything was surprising. Uh, you know, that's why I, I wrote about it. I mean, the thing is, it's just that I, like when I was in college, I just, I did take biology and chemistry, but um, I don't know, I guess maybe I was intimidated by the complexity and the, the fact that I could now understand this. Um, I don't know. I wanted to explain it to other people because I had such a sense of wonder about what we were finding out. So the most surprising thing was just how interesting I found it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because no, I wasn't really a science guy before and I just followed it. I mean, it didn't have to be extreme. It didn't have to be a genocide or, or some, you know, it's equally high stakes. We're talking about people's lives and ability to, you know, connect with the world and the people around them. And, and so, and originally I had been kind of interested like, oh, this is a superpower. Well, we can hack this and we can augment people. And that was how I originally pitched the book. But then I just came to discover that, you know, the areas where it was having the most human impact was in restoring resilience to people who had lost something, yeah. even though it could be the same technologies could be applied to give us the ability. If you're, if you're giving somebody the ability to, um, you know, see with a device that, you know, connects to their brain and, and sends visual images, you could just use an infrared camera and give somebody the ability to see in the dark or see through walls, you know, but it's really what's fueling this is the desire to give people who are, have lost some ability, that ability back. So, um, I don't know, just the whole thing was, was just, uh, it was just meaningful. You know, you think of science as something that's dead and, and I just found so much life in it, you know, it's so much yeah. passion mm -hmm. and, and so that, that's what continually blows my mind. I still sometimes write about science, you know. And it definitely push, pushes the envelope, you know, and explores what's possible for humans physically and even spiritually, mentally, emotionally. You know, toward the end of your book, you talk about Gerwin Schalk and the, the ambition he has or these, these possibilities that he entertains about all human minds potentially someday being seamlessly integrated. We hear now more and more about this singularity. But it's interesting to wonder how much of that is really possible or even likely after this, after having done this research and talked with so many of these thought leaders and these researchers firsthand, what's your view on that? Uh, yeah, I, I don't know about artificial intelligence and, and the singularity. I mean, I, but because uh, I haven't really thought that much about that. And it's like, I, and um, so I don't know about like, computers getting a mind of their own and kind of taking over or, 
or, uh, but, uh, but us merging, I mean, he's talking about being able to plug into this giant hive mind, Gerwin yeah. Schalk. Uh, and, and that is, he thinks is sort of the logical extension of if, if we can, um, you know, if we don't need to use our own speech to communicate our ideas, if we can just decode the signals of the brain and connect directly to, to the internet and we're all there. I mean, that makes sense that that might be possible. I don't know yeah. if people would want to do that. Um, I, I think it's kind of cool, but um, but I don't know. I'd still rather go hiking in the woods you know, <laughs> with my family. No, I'm 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 with you. Okay, so let me shift now to the lightning round. If you're if you're good with a bit of a change of pace in the interview here, sure. Okay, first question. Please complete the following sentence with something other than a box of chocolates. Life is like a. Uh, big adventure. Okay. Number two, what's something at which you wish you were better? Uh, I don't know. Um, basketball. Hmm. All right. Number three. Maybe just because we were talking about the Utah jazz. I don't know. Yeah. Could have been uh, what's that word? Um, priming a little bit of in the background there. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Number three. Um, if you were required every day for the rest of your life to wear a t-shirt with a slogan on it or a phrase or a saying or a quote or a quip, what would the shirt say? Um, hmm. Well, I have one now that's, that says siesta on it over and over. I like that. <laughs> and, and my wife, uh, her father, uh, is, is Spanish, lives in Spain. And they also got me a shirt, um, with a picture of a fat guy lying down asleep and it says Spanish yoga. <laughs> I don't know. Lately I've been embracing my, and then I'm a freelancer now, so I can nap at will when I don't have deadlines. So yeah. Isn't napping glorious? Yeah. I like to say even better than caffeine. Yeah. So it's the simple things now. I mean, I used to be really passionate and I would have had some other slogan, but at the moment with kids who are eight and 10 living in the suburbs, you know, writing books and, and different stuff. I napping is my, uh, passion. All right. Number five. So you travel a ton or you have, what's one travel hack, something you do or something you take with you when you travel to make you travel less painful or more enjoyable? Hmm. Well, I guess, um, I'm not really sure, but I mean, I, I always try and bring a good book, but, um, what I found to be most important is, um, when I have to travel a lot is like a routine you know, and exercise. So exercise can help. Um, and, uh, and so if I can exercise wherever I go once a day, I don't get too out of control, like just eating burgers and, and feeling unhealthy. Uh, you know, although I guess if it's really hot and I'm in the back country of Cambodia, but, uh, or, or, or in the Amazon or something, I'm not really going to exercise. Um, so in that case, yeah, I'm not really sure. But but for business trips, you know, when I'm in a hotel and stuff, it's um, and it's not necessarily an adventure uh, that's, you know, stimulating my senses. I, I try and exercise. What kind of routine do you follow? Mm, well, I don't know. Calling my wife and kids, um, getting up at a certain hour, writing um, uh, and uh, exercising. I, I don't know. I just I, I've written it like when I was uh, before the Iraq war. Uh, like that we were talking about before I traveled a lot. Like I was in Germany, uh, on a, off of a military base for weeks waiting to deploy with this one unit. And then I was in Kuwait and Turkey and various places. And it kind of made me miserable because, um, after a while the, the novelty wore off and I was isolated and I got really kind of depressed. So at some point I did a story and that was kind of the advice that people that I gleaned from that. Like if you have to be away from home a lot, and you're going to be in hotel rooms to the point where the novelty kind of wears off. It's important to have things that you do every day and kind of a schedule that can serve as a touchstone that you can take with you wherever you go. Um, I mean, I, I, other than that, like when, I, when I'm traveling, like I said, to the Amazon or the back country of Cambodia or something, I just try and make sure I have everything I need and, and good music and stuff is, is good for downtime. Um, but it's, it's like stimulating and an adventure and it's exciting and I'm taking notes. So it's not really going to make me depressed. What I'm worried about is, is when you're, you know, you're away from your family and the things that you've built 
you know, that, you know, make you happy. How do you prevent from being, you know, prevent yourself from becoming too depressed? Yeah. I, and I hear you. And, and I realize when I travel, I get so out of most of my routines and I am, I know most of us are creatures of habit, but I don't know if this happens to you, but when I travel and I find myself feeling really unsettled or feeling depressed or, or just not feeling good. And I, I attribute it to the fact that my routine is broken down that and a combination of, I'm not in the environments that I normally inhabit, seeing the people that I inhabit, which of course is part of a routine. I actually then get down about the fact that rather than just being wherever I am, being pleased with wherever, like whatever I'm doing, whoever I'm with, it kind of adds a layer that amplifies that, that downness I have. Do you, I know this is kind of like a meta <laughs> thought, but I don't know if that happened. Like, I'll bet the Buddha didn't get down when he traveled. <laughs> you know what I mean? Well, well actually, what I was going to say is, I mean, I, sometimes when I get down when I'm traveling, it's, I realize, and I didn't realize, I don't know why I didn't realize this before. It's because I'm isolated and not connecting with people. So mm. it can be good to call people that you care about and connect with them. Yeah. But another, but when you mentioned the Buddha, that's what I was going to say. I mean, sort of actually when I, when, with a hack, my utility tool, Aside from exercise, the, one of the most useful ones is meditation, mm. you know, and, and with meditation, which is, it's like a practice, just like going to the gym, it can be very unpleasant at first. But if you, if you practice it with meditation, when I start to feel the way you're saying, um, I can just focus on my breath and try and sit with the emotion and just kind of accept the emotion and accept how I feel and just try and sit with it and absorb it until it's not bringing me down necessarily you know, make space for it. Yeah. You know, um, I, 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 uh, I, one of the fa my favorite things that I've done also was I wrote about these Vietnam vets who had been in this, um, calamitous battle, um, where, uh, somebody won a medal of honor and everybody was traumatized and then they went their separate ways and didn't talk to each other for years and then reunited through the internet. And I did a, an hour long radio special about them with, uh, the producer for the moth, a guy named Jay Allison. And, um, I was just really interested in, in how these guys, um, I'm going off on a total tangent here, but how these guys, like a lot of them, they didn't deal with the trauma and a lot of them self-destructed, but some of them were still around, had made peace with it and had lived to retirement and overcome their demons. And, uh, and one of them said, uh, you got to make friends with it. Hmm. Yeah. I don't know. There's a long way of, a long way of saying something brief, but, but, um, I was just really struck. He had been tormented by his traumatic memories from this uh, night when a lot of people were killed. And the only thing that set him free was when he realized it can't be his enemy anymore. He's got to make friends with it no matter how bad it was. So mm -hmm. I don't know. So that's a kind of an extreme thing to talk about yeah. uh, when you're traveling. But meditation is a tool to kind of sit with things yeah. so that you can reckon with them and make friends with it. Yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I think you're right. I think the principle is the same. The mechanics are the same of, you know, trying, like not want, not welcoming it, you know, that what meditators, many me aversion, aversion and attachment that yeah. not just flowing with just amplifies, you know, the Buddhists often call the second arrow, but um, well, who have been some of your, your teachers or, or how, I mean, I realize meditation is ultimately a very personal practice. But who has inspired you and what have you learned? What do you practice? I sort of dabbled in it for so long since I was like 18. Like when I was in college, I was into humanistic psychology. And I, like I said, I went to school at, um, at UC Santa Cruz. So I just kind of, I don't know who I learned from there. I just tried different meditations and, and I read various things. But, you know, my mom is really into meditation and she's always buying me these books and stuff by people like Pema Chodron. And I just, I'm not, I don't really have the patience to read that stuff anymore. <laughs> I mean, when I was in Cambodia, I would go to this Buddhist wat and meditate uh, once a week. And that was kind of cool and pretty intense. Um, but now um, I don't know if I have really any, I mean, I've read the Buddhist stuff and um, but I'm not, I, I'm not following one. I mean, I don't know, I guess Jack Cornfield's cool. Um, but, uh, I also, um, you know, sometimes when I want to start again and I haven't been doing it for a while, I, I even use an app called Headspace, which oh, is yeah. just some British guy with a shaved head who I read about in the New York times. And he just gives a guided meditation. But, uh, but I do that for a while till I get back into it, you know? Okay. So it's, it's more a tool like exercising than, than like, than like a path where I'm, trying to understand it at this yeah. point in my life. Yeah. No, I, I, I get it. Okay. Question number six. 
What's one thing you've started or stopped doing in order to live or age well? Uh, drinking, smoking. Started or stopped? <laughs> stopped. <laughs> well, yeah, they got me through college, you know, there. And, uh, but, uh, let's see. So, um, yeah, I don't, I, I quit. I mean, I'm 48. I, I haven't had a drink in since 2005. So that's a long time or, or smoked. And uh, I tried to replace those things with, um, with, uh, exercise and, and things like meditation. What's made that stick? I mean, you just make a decision one day and boom, that was it. I mean, it wasn't easy. It hasn't been easy, but for me, it's, it's kind of like, I live, I was living a certain lifestyle and it wasn't getting me what I wanted. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. So I just had to, uh, kind of, I mean, I don't know. And it seemed like smoking, smoking obviously was going to kill me. And, and I know that from, and from smoking, I've quit and started again a gazillion times. And so I know that you have to quit that cold Turkey. And so when I decided to do the same thing with drinking, it's like, um, I already knew that, um, that's sort of my pattern, you know, yeah. if there's some sort of habit that I do. And, you know, I don't like that, I, that I had to, you know, sometimes relied on alcohol to relax or something. You know yeah. what I mean? You should be able to do that without it. So, um, I don't know. Well, and it makes me think of that saying I hear attributed to Twain about, I know I can quit smoking. I've done it a thousand times. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of times I would quit smoking and I would start again because I had had a few beers or something, you yeah. know? So if I really want to quit smoking, I had to quit drinking too, but mm. I don't know. It just wasn't serving me. I was single. I wanted to get married and have a family, you know? So, yeah. I think you will live longer and uh, probably feel better. But do smoking, don't you think there really is some aspect of it that it's kind of like chocolate and peanut butter with writing and smoking? I mean, that's my experience. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I mean, there is certain chemicals that it releases in the brain. I put that in my book proposal for the bodybuilders, you know, uh, as just because um, originally it was going to be about human augmentation. People use tobacco to augment their cognitive abilities just as they use coffee. So yeah. it does help focus you to a certain extent. And there's certain neurotransmitters that it, it affects. Um, I forget what they are right now. Yeah. Acetylcholine or something. Number seven. What's one thing you wish every American knew? Uh, how I guess how lucky and privileged we are and how much we have to lose. Mm. I feel like we, we take it to, uh, to, um, for granted. Oh, can can you can I answer another question here? Of course. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hold on. Sorry, I keep getting these these things. Um, second question. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries at all. Um it's like, you know that um Sandy Hook father who committed suicide? Uh, yeah, I saw that story. That they, sucks. they they wanted he he was like really into brain health. And, uh, and, and studying and funding research into, um, uh, so that we could help people who were at risk of being a danger to others and themselves. Uh, he, he had a background in neuroscience and then he committed suicide. So they wanted to know, they wanted me to write a story immediately by 12 noon today. They called me at like seven last night talking to people about what's known about suicide in the brain. You know, yeah, that is a that is a tragic story. And I, I finally picked up a book I'd been hearing about. I wonder if you've if you've read or you're familiar with the work of Bessel van der Kolk, the guy that wrote The Body Keeps the Score, Brain, Mind and Body and the Healing of Trauma. No, sounds this interesting book, though. This book yeah, is blowing my mind. It's it's got it's got nineteen hundred five star reviews on Amazon. <clears throat> and somebody mentioned it to me last year and I just went and did a workshop in, in California last month that was actually an embodied masculinity and an intimacy workshop. But the guy who teaches it is it's all somatic learning and it's, it's very, it's breath work, it's movement. And most of what I've been learning in my coaching and leadership has been very intellectual. So it was a welcome, you know, shift. And that, that workshop inspired me to pick up this book and it has been, I've been reading 10 pages a day and it just blows my mind. Yeah. The body keeps the score brain, mind, and body in the healing of trauma and it's yeah, see, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I'm like really into, or in college, I was really into that kind of thing. I mean, I think that's really cool. Like, you know, I'm into that with meditation and stuff, you know, just that, um, that when I was talking about meditation before that you can 
like there's no point in in um when something's bothering you maybe obsessing about it after a certain point right. it's, it's the most effective way to deal with it is to sit with it to locate where that feeling is in your body and sit with it yeah you know so yeah. i'm interested in that and i did i tried breath work once a long time ago and it was pretty powerful so yeah. i think maybe i'll read that i like uh, this guy reich wilhelm reich you know reiki and body armor he, he's a he's uh a, i don't know him tell tell me about him I don't actually didn't study him that much, but he, I think he's the one who kind of originated a lot of these ideas <laughs> that our trauma and our experiences are stored in the body. Yeah. That's what, that's what this author says is about. There's no amount of even cognitive behavioral therapy or talk therapy that's going to ultimately help us resolve what's ultimately treat in our physiology, you know? And it's like, that is amazing. And this guy is, um, you know, he's Harvard trained and he's, his experience is incredible. He's probably been working in this field for f almost 50 years from what I'm reading in his stories, you know. But I think if this is your area of, you know, interest, you might really like this book. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds interesting. I'll check it out. Okay. So we're coming down the stretch on, on this. Just um, two more questions in the lightning round. Um, what advice have your parents given you that has made a difference and maybe even you know, it stayed with you. So, so let me re-ask the question. What advice did your parents give you that has impacted you? Well, I, I don't know. I guess, I mean, my parents always told me, um, do what you love and are passionate about and the money will follow, which uh, in the case of journalism, it didn't actually turn out really to be that true, <laughs> <laughs> but it definitely influenced me, uh, you know. Um, so I think about that. I mean, I don't know. That's probably what influenced me the most. I, I don't know. My, my mom is a writer and, uh, and she um, has an artistic temperament. My father always told me it was important to, you know, contribute to society. And my mom sort of taught me how to appreciate beauty and art and stuff. Hmm. Sounds like a great duo. Yeah. And, it, and, and from what you said earlier in the interview, it sounds like they were loving and, and nurturing and they've stayed together. And it's like, no, uh, they're not together. Oh, they no? got divorced. Ah. It was a total train wreck, but <laughs> at some point, but I don't need to get into that in this sure, interview. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, uh, enough, enough for me to go into therapy when I was younger, but you know, I'm 48 uh, now. So. Well, I once heard, I think it was George Carlin. I think it was Carlin who said, you know, the amazing thing isn't that half of all marriages end in divorce. The amazing thing is that half of all marriages end in more marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and as one who's been divorced, I can I, I can empathize with that. But okay, yeah, they figured it out. They're both remarried now, but happy. Uh, but let me ask you this: while while we're here, and and I want to be sure to to get it in and not try to squeeze it in at the end. If people want to learn more from you or they want to connect with you, what should they do? Uh, well, I, I mean, I'm all, I'm reachable through my website adampiori.com, which I haven't updated that much. It's um, recently, but you can. There's an option there to to email me. So you can email me through that anytime. Yeah. Um, and then, I don't know, you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, hashtag Adam Peori, I guess. I, I post links to my stories there. Um, and uh, yeah, I write about a lot of things, you know, um, nowadays. I still do science stuff. Like, I mean, you mentioned Columbia. I just had a, I don't know if you saw the article I had in Scientific American where I went down to the Colombian Amazon yeah, and wrote about efforts to protect... Yeah, the world's last uncontacted people. Um, and uh, let's see, what do I have? How do you? How do those negotiations with the wife go? By the way, I'm just like, hey, I'm going to go write about uncontacted tribes in Colombia. There's only a hundred left in the world. I'll be back. <laughs> like, how does that go? Well, I mean, actually, that story took like three years to come to fruition. You know, so it was like, uh, I mean, like I was going to go at one point. And it, it was, it was a really long drawn out process first to pitch the story, but I knew it was a good story. So I was talking about it. So she knew I wanted to go and thought it sounded like a good adventure. Then I finally found um, a magazine that wanted it, Scientific American. And then uh, they had to, you know, the NGO that works with these people on the periphery of the, the tribal lands had to go to the, those people on, on the periphery of the tribal lands and get their consent for me to come visit them. Then finally we found a day when uh, a date when I could go. And then right when I was going to go like the week or two before we had to cancel because um, like demobilized FARC guerrillas were seen in the area 
um, like, you know, robbing people and it was wow. and with guns. So it wasn't safe. So then that was delayed for like a year. So by the time I finally went, you know, sometimes I have to negotiate for like the amount of time I'm gone. Like they wanted me to go for six weeks. They wanted to take me down the river, this long river. And she was like, you're not going for six weeks. But uh, I don't know. I just, I, I have a pitch into Business Week. I've been talking to my editor about there about that would take me down to Brazil, not the Brazilian Amazon, just something else. And she's like, I want you to go because that's what you love to do. Wow. Amazing. As long as I don't do too much, you know? Yeah. I travel like, if I, it's hard for me to convince her to, let me travel more than a week at a time. Yeah. Especially with two kids, it's got to be challenging. Yeah. So. But uh, it, it also depends on like what's going on with her schedule. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's easier than other times, but I, you know, I work at home. That's the other thing I work at home so I can help out. So I do have to travel to collect information for my stories, but um, other times I'm, I'm home. So there's yeah. a, trade-off. Well, one one thing I want to be sure to let you know before we wrap up is that um, as an expression of my gratitude to you for making so much time and sharing generously of your experience and, and your wisdom, I've gone on to Kiva.org and I've made a $100 microloan to an entrepreneur in India on your behalf. It's a 36-year-old woman named Tinku who will use this. She Her household brings in about $136, the equivalent of $136 US dollars a month, but she's going to use this loan to purchase more wood and expand a wood selling business. So in some way, and, and not firewood, people will actually use this wood to build furniture locally. So hopefully it will help improve the quality of life for her family, people in her community. So that's uh, one way I've endeavored to say thank you. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So last few questions um, are about writing. If we go ahead and switch gears one final time. I love, I read in your acknowledgments that your mom is a writer. You just mentioned that. I want, I'd like to start there to ask, how has your mom, you mentioned that your mom was someone to whom you were grateful for her involvement in this book, in the bodybuilders. How did she contribute to the work or what difference did she make with this project? And then overall, how has she shaped or contributed to you as a writer? Well, she was, she just was willing to read all my, a lot of my chapters and um, also would read like a lot of times, you know, I mean, when you're a professional writer or journalist, you, writer's block isn't really an option, but you still have to face it down. Right. So a lot of times um, I would just be starting off. And the hardest part is to start a chapter or or start a new story. And so I would, um, you know, and you call the beginning of a, an article the lead. So she would she lets me read her my leads over the phone. I'm always um making her listen to them. And she read my stuff and gave me advice and told me when things were boring or didn't make any sense or when they were fascinating, you know, and she's not a scientist. So um, it was, it was useful because I was writing. I mean, like I said, I discovered uh, the wonder of science and I wanted to explain to people the incredible things we're learning about how the human and body, body and mind work in a way that, um, you know, and tell it through stories of individual people so that, um, you know, I just wanted to tell good stories which I like to do anyways, but in the context of that, you know, show these remarkable things that we're learning. Um, and, and I think you, you've succeeded in that, by the way, the book is full of incredible stories. It's, and it's very personal. Like I, I, in fact, I found myself wishing I could be there as you were having these conversations with scientists or doctors or watching procedures. So you succeeded on that in my book. Yeah, it's cool. It's, I love, I love what I do, but, um, but, uh, also, so she, um, she helped a lot in reading and uh, and giving advice and telling me when things were boring or didn't work and making suggestions. Um, and then, you know, I just over the years, I've learned, you know, she even when I was a kid, she would read my stuff and give me advice. Um, actually, she would correct my papers. And, and when I got into Columbia Journalism School, I actually didn't really know how to use commas correctly because um, I had all, she would always make the corrections and tell me, and I would just say, leave me alone. And then I was a good enough writer that it didn't, I didn't fail, even though people would say it was sloppy. But then when I got to Columbia Journalism School, they um, said if they were going to fail me out unless I learned how to use commas. So I had to get a tutor to learn how to use commas uh, for a little while. A uh, little uh, anecdote there. But, uh, but other than that, punctuation, which I didn't have patience for when I was younger. Uh, by the way, commas are great. 
they yep. allow you to control the pacing of, of, of your writing. And I'm glad that I mastered them and had a tutor for them. But, but she taught me uh, some things too, like, you know, some writing basics like show, don't tell. Um, one of the things uh, also that I, I feel like is one of the best pieces of advice I've ever gotten is that um, good writing is in the details and in the specifics. Mm-hmm. Um, so I could say I walked into a room, but it's not as powerful as saying, I walked into a room, it was brightly lit, hot. I could feel the feel, you know, writing with the senses, I could feel the feel of, of the carpet under my feet. You know, if you add specifics, it makes it more real to people. And even when you're doing an argument, adding specifics is what makes good writing. Oh, a- absolutely. I, I, I was reading this to my kids at the lunch table on Saturday afternoon and talking of the specifics, we were just blown away by some of the details you shared about the workings of the human body what you go into about red blood cells and how we have 25 trillion of them and how that means we replenish about two to 3 million every second, you know? So again, yeah, showing, helping us to see some of this, this magic and awe of the human body was really compelling. Yeah. Great. I'm glad you liked it. Who else has been influential in shaping your writing and what have you learned from them? You know, I've, I've gone through different phases. I had a Hemingway phase at one point. I used to like this writer, Pat Conroy, and then eventually, I don't like Pat Conroy anymore. It seems his writing seems flowery and ridiculous. But at one point, it was influential for me. There's a, a journalist I really like named Mark Bowden who did Black Hawk Down and, yeah. and had a lot of great stories. Um, I don't know. Uh, I read Sports Illustrated. Had really good. It's really good at metaphors and 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 uh, I learned how to use those and stuff. And I mean, working at Newsweek was like getting a PhD in writing. You know, there's great writers there, and they taught me a lot. What else did you learn from your time at, at Newsweek, writing itself as a craft or about the industry or just working with other human beings or yourself, anything? What, because that was, it sounds like that was a really formative um, place for you. Well, you know, I personally found working at Newsweek to be chall- a lot more challenging than working at daily newspapers where I worked before. Uh, and part of the reason is that, um, it was very competitive, I think, and I wasn't at the, and there was sort of a hierarchy that was constantly shifting. And uh, so you really had to not try, not keep score the whole time and, and just be detached and focus on the work. Um, and it was very competitive uh, to get the space in the magazine sometimes, um, especially the domestic edition. Um, so um, I had to learn to sort of control my emotions and, um, and uh, you know, trust, have faith that everything would work out. But, you know, where, where it was really driven home for me is after I went to Iraq and, and uh, came home and then I wanted to go freelance, but I, I was really burnt out. So I decided I was going to, I had some money saved up. I decided I was going to learn how to write screenplays and take a break from journalism. Uh, and so I got a job in the mailroom of Weight Watchers um, while, you know, a part-time job and because I wanted something totally low pressure and kind of ridiculous. And and so I was doing that and writing screenplays and I thought it would be not that stressful, but uh, I followed around my boss, the head of the mailroom. And I remember having this incredible moment where we were in the freight elevator with uh, other people who were doing mail for other floors. And they were like, I can't believe he put the mail like that. And, you know, I don't know. They just sounded exactly like editors at Newsweek. <laughs> They had the same delusions of grandeur, the same problems, the same criticism of other coworkers. And, and it was just like it, a light bulb went off in my head. Like, it doesn't matter what you do. That's just, you know, the nature of things. So you really shouldn't take it that seriously. Like, I didn't care about my future as a mail sorter at Weight Watchers. That reminds me of that Hunter S. Thompson quote about life's become a lot more bearable once I stopped taking it so seriously. <laughs> yeah. Kind of thing. Yeah. So that was good. I mean, at Newsweek, I mean, you just... Uh, I mean, now I, I don't, um, I work from home. I'm, I'm self-employed. I, I have a bunch of people I, I write for, you know, I'm on contract with different magazines, but um, it's a lot less stressful. But, um, you know, also I feel I, I kind of, I don't know if I learned this at Newsweek or somewhere else, but when you have a, a, a difficult boss, actually it wasn't at Newsweek, but I'll just, it was somewhere else. When you have a difficult boss, the way to get through it, I learned is, is um, I just told myself I was getting paid to take her shit. You know, that was part of what I was getting paid for. Mm. And that made it a lot easier, you yeah. know, Yeah, <laughs> I didn't get along with this one boss and I just tried to do what she wanted and tried the best I could. 
And if she didn't like it or wasn't happy, um, you know, I did the best I could. And part of my job was to take her abuse if she wanted to be abusive. And if I didn't like it, I could leave. But that was part of my part of my job description. Yeah. So that's been helpful too. Like, so if you work in a stressful place and stuff, you know, you can leave and get another job, or you can just accept it as try and not take it personally and just, but realize it's it's just part of the job. Yeah, that that's a really mature perspective, I think especially when, or maybe only when, from my view, when you add, and if I don't like it, I can leave. The, the element of choice is always present. Okay. Um, what book, I'm going to go, I'm going to go back to a question I like to ask in a lightning round. I didn't ask, but I'll ask now. What book other than your own have you gifted or recommended most often? Hmm. Kind of just depends on what, like what I'm into at that point and the person. I'm not really sure. I mean, I'm reading, I just like, I'm reading this book right now called the weight of ink that I got for Christmas from somebody. And like, I'm going to give that as a gift because it's so good. Cause I'm totally into it now, but six months from now, I will have forgotten that I'm looking at my bookshelf right now. William Finnegan barbarian days, a, a surfing life. That was a bestseller. And it's a, a New York, New Yorker writer. That was a great book. I'm looking at Mark Bowden's way 1968. That was a great book. So I don't know. It just depends. Yeah. You know, I don't have, if there's so many great books. No, um, I liked, no. I mean, I do, I, two books that I, that I, I really liked that were really long that I sometimes tell people about, but I haven't read in like a decade. I don't even know if I still like them were Stephen King's The Stand and Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove. Mm. Um, both those books are, are great. Very well. Like Larry McMurtry's Lonesome Dove. I, I just love the way it was written. I remember at the time. So. Yeah. Those are both quite lengthy books. Aren't they? I mean, The Stand's almost a thousand pages. And Lonesome Dove's probably five or 600, I would guess. Good good books on a, maybe on a cruise ship or a desert island or beach somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so last, last few questions. What are the qualities of a great sentence and how can we write more of them? Um, well, you know, actually, uh, one thing that I learned as, as being a writer is that, um, oh, another great book I'm looking at now, David Benioff. He's the guy who, did, um, who does Game of Thrones. But he has a book called City of Thieves, which is one of my favorite books of all time. It's a novel. It's very little known, but I recommend that. City of Thieves, David Benioff. I thought that was Martin. He wrote the book Game of Thrones, but David Benioff is one of the people who writes the TV show. Oh, okay. But he's got a book called City of Thieves. I see. Because he's also a novelist, but he's a TV writer. So he's oh. one of the showrunners that did is uh, did uh, Game of Thrones. But George Martin wrote the book, That's right. which, by the way, is also a great book. But uh, qualities of a great sentence. Well, so it's it's less about um, it's less about like the mechanics of the sentence itself than the content. Again, so it's like I mean I find find sort of novice writers that want to be good writers or good writers who are young and want to be writers. Like they focus a lot on flowery language and words, but it's not really about that. The sentence itself should be. I mean, I, I like using sentences for rhythm and stuff. I mean, using commas for rhythm and stuff in my sentences, but mm. it's not really about, um, and, and so that's something I, I sometimes do, but it's more about um, what the sentences say. The sentences should be transparent and like glass in a window that you're looking into. People should be able to forget that they're reading. And the way you do that is you, you write with scenes, you paint pictures and stuff, you know, and, or you argue, you know, so it's, it, again, it's a good sentence has details and specifics and isn't, doesn't have extraneous stuff. It doesn't get in the way of your experience of reading yeah. without conveying information. What's the best money you ever spent as a writer? I don't know. Probably, um, quitting my job is covering Congress and traveling to Southeast Asia and, you know, accepting, like, if my career ends, that's fine, but I want to have adventures and see what's out in the world. Felt so liberated. It's so worth it. Yeah. And the experience that you have, the well that you dig for yourself to draw upon and share with others in your writing, I imagine that's yeah. very, well, very just, I mean, and, and it was, and, and I was writing about really meaningful things, you know. What advice do you have for those who are either in the middle of a book project of their own or they, they want to write it, but they maybe haven't taken the first steps because it's just so daunting or they don't think, you know, that they can do it. What do you say to somebody who's either stuck or stuck in the middle or they're stuck not having yet begun? Uh, well, um, a good friend of mine, Josh Shank, 
Will Shank, who wrote a bunch of books and is at UNLV, once told me that writing a book is 95% mental. And so it, just like I said, the part of the job when you're getting a salary and have a difficult boss is to take that boss's shit or leave and you get paid for that. Um, you have to understand that part of writing a book is managing the mental pressure and the fear. So yeah, you just have to, you have to recognize it as that. And, and, um, I mean, we've talked a lot about emotions and, uh, you know, making friends with it and stuff. Sometimes you can't fight how you feel. If you're held back by fear, you just have to acknowledge that fear and carry it like you're carrying a backpack or something and move forward. And, uh, and so, um, that's if you're stuck, you know, yeah. um, and then in terms of like, um, getting started, I don't know. I mean, not that I followed this advice myself, but I have a friend who wrote a novel and what he did is he just wrote 30 minutes a day at Starbucks every day. And eventually he had a novel and, uh, and I've done that and it's taken the pressure off because I know I'm going to write the next day, but I didn't have the discipline to keep doing it because I write for a living doing journalism. So I never wrote a novel. I ran out of steam, but uh, I tell people, I mean, that is good advice. Like if you just take a, a uh, if you pick a time where you're just going to write half an hour a day and you do it every day, then even if you're just writing on the screen, the same thing that Jack Nicholson wrote, in The Shining, all work, no play makes Johnny a dull boy, all work, no play. You know, you do that for half an hour, it doesn't matter because you're going to do another, the next day you're going to do half an hour. So there's no pressure. Yeah. So it doesn't matter if you're just writing shit, you know, because you can just, you know. You know. Yeah, sh show, showing up. There's a lot to be said for that. Okay, so last last question is, you know, just during the course of this interview, seeing how you're connected, you know, with with you said it's Newsweek and obviously all the different places you've been in your career, the different you know publications you have relationships with and the, the editors and, and others there. How do you think about networking as a writer? How important is it and what advice do you have for developing writers when it comes to actually developing and maintaining relationships? Um, I mean, it's just pretty important for me. I mean, uh, uh, I, you can do without it, but it's like, like for me, when I want to write, it's, it's just like editors will read my pitches and uh, they're more likely to read them. If I, uh, a blind pitch, if I have some sort of connection to them and if, uh, you know, if I know them or so networking can be very helpful in opening doors, but you know, it's not totally necessary, but I could ask a friend, Hey, I want to pitch a story to, to this place. Do you know somebody there? And then they might give me an email and the person might open my email and be more willing to read it. But um, if I don't have that and I want to pitch, um, you know, a certain magazine, I'll just study the magazine and, and sort of see what kind of stories they like and then try and just really nail the pitch and make it, you know, tailor it to them. Um, so, but, but networking is, is good. I mean, and you also just need to get experience, you know, in clips. Yeah. Well, Adam, thank you so much for, for again, being so generous with your time today. I really appreciate it. I, I enjoyed your book very much, and uh, I love how many different things you're writing about and exploring and, and um, the, just the diversity of your, your curiosity. So, so thank you for that, for your writing, and, and for your time today. Thank you. Despite living in an age where we have more comforts and conveniences than ever before, life isn't working for many people. Whether it's in the developed world, where we're dealing with depression, anxiety, addiction, divorce, jobs we hate, relationships that don't work, or people in the developing world who don't have access to clean water or sanitation or healthcare or education, or who live in conflict zones, there's a lot of people on the planet that life isn't working very well for. If you're one of those people, I invite you to connect with me at goodliving.com. I've created Life's Best Practices Breakthrough Coaching to help you navigate the transitions that we all go through. Whether you've just graduated school, you're going through a divorce, you just got married, you're headed into retirement, you're starting a business, you just lost your job, whatever it is you're facing, I've developed a 36-week course that you go through with me and a community of achievers and seekers who are committed to improving their own lives and the lives of others. So through this online program, you will have the opportunity to go deep into every area of your life, explore life's big questions, create answers for yourself in community get clarity and accountability. If that's something you're interested to learn about, I invite you to contact me directly 
at bryant at or by visiting goodliving.com. 